Welcome to Bankless, where today we got a special announcement for you. The Unichain. This is Uniswap's chain. This was predicted for a very long time, and now it's coming to pass. We've got Hayden Adams from Uniswap, the founder of Uniswap. We also have Carl Flourish. He is a co-founder of Optimism, which maybe gives you a sense for what layer two they're going to launch on. <laughs> Smash these on... two things together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what you get. <laughs> yeah, you get a unicorn looking chain. And so uh, they are here to announce this and talk about it today. Uh, we, we get into the details. We also have some kind of like uh, questions or, or pushback, mm -hmm. right? Some some current discussions in the Ethereum world of what do we do? Another chain? Does this result in more fragmentation? How is this good for Ether the asset? Where should DeFi live? Should it lay live on layer twos or, or layer ones? Anyway, uh, Hayden and Carl give the context for that, what they're planning with this Unichain uh, project and uh, answers to many of those questions. I think this is going to start off a very big conversation in the Ethereum space because this this is not just you know another generalized layer two. Uh, this is not another optimism, another base, another arbitrum. This is an application getting a chain. And so you got to tip your hat to the Cosmos people who always predicted that apps will one day become chains. Uh, and uh, because and the biggest app, what is the biggest app on Ethereum? It's Uniswap. So of course it's going to be the first one to get its own chain. But this is going to start a trend because the uni chain is going to push the frontier on some very hard problems in the Ethereum space, chain interoperability, chain abstraction, uh, you know, bridging without having to impose that choice upon users. This they are going to put a lot of you know research and investment and energy into abstracting the chains, carving a path for the next biggest app to follow suit, and then it will get its own app chain. And so I think this is a, kind of going to be a kind of a landmark moment in the Ethereum rollup centric roadmap when the largest app on the layer one gets becomes a very prominent chain inside of the super chain. Huge win for Optimism. Uh, an inevitable conclusion by Uniswap, predicted by many. Uh, many have always said that apps will always uh, be incented to get its own chain. Dan Elitzer, shout out to Dan Elitzer to put, who put the first formal words of yeah, I mean, Uniswap. He may have known it before Hayden that yeah, Uniswap he, is getting a chain. <laughs> the blog post said it. Unichain is inevitable and, and here that, that day is finally here. Uh, very big moment uh, for both these teams, but also I think for the, the greater Ethereum ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, I think so. And I also think in the aftermath of this, it's going to cause further discussion from mm -hmm. those in the Ethereum community who are like, wait a second, we still want some of the DeFi apps and liquidity on layer one. And how's this going to work if all of the liquidity goes into layer two? If so. we push it all to the layer twos, if everything goes to the layer twos and they are also perfectly abstracted, then everything then is just one one massive network. See, these are the types of conversations uh, that are going mm -hmm. on. And, uh, well, we won't spoil uh, Hayden and Carl's take on it. It's a little bit of the best way out is through. Mm -hmm. But we'll yes. get to that episode. Before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, including our number one recommended exchange, the place where you can transition your fiat into the magical world of crypto, that is Kraken. Go create an account. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading, involves risk of loss. Radically simple ideas always tend to catch on. That's why Cartesi did the hard work of putting Linux on chain so that building dApps can be radically simple by using Python or JavaScript and their suite of libraries. Simple, like not rebuilding the basics from scratch. Simple, like dedicated scalable compute for your dApp. Simple, like building dApps however you want. Web3 should be simple too, like bread and butter. Cartesi brings radically simple solutions to Ethereum so developers can do what they do best, build. Go ahead and discover a flexible modular stack on Cartesi and build your most powerful, ambitious project yet. Visit cartesi.io slash simple and simplify your blockchain journey and start building today. The Arbitrum portal is your one-stop hub to entering the Ethereum ecosystem. With over 800 apps, Arbitrum offers something for everyone. 
Dive into the epicenter of DeFi, where advanced trading, lending, and staking platforms are redefining how we interact with money. Explore Arbitrum's rapidly growing gaming hub, from immersed role-playing games, fast-paced fantasy MMOs, to casual luck battle mobile games. Move assets effortlessly between chains and access the ecosystem with ease via Arbitrum's expansive network of bridges and on-ramps. Step into Arbitrum's flourishing NFT and creator space, where artists, collectors, and social converge and support your favorite streamers all on-chain. Find new and trending apps and learn how to earn rewards across the Arbitrum ecosystem with limited time campaigns from your favorite projects. Empower your future with Arbitrum. Visit portal.arbitrum.io to find out what's next on your Web3 journey. Bankless Nation, I'm here with Carl Florsch, the chief optimist over at OP Labs, and also Hayden Adams, the chief unicorn officer over at Uniswap Labs. Carl and Hayden, welcome back to Bankless. Thank you very much. So uh, why are the creators of, one, the OP Stack framework, and two, the Uniswap AMM on the same podcast? What are you guys doing here? Uh, you know, just hanging out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, obviously there's been a long, a lot of speculation about whether or not Uniswap eventually should have its own chain, and that's really what we're here to talk about and announce that and, um, you know, just talk about how it fits into our products and roadmaps and like Ethereum's scaling future. Okay, so dropping the uni chain, I think, uh, is a pretty big cannonball into the into the lake of Ethereum. Uh, Carl, can you talk about just like the significance of this? Like, what what does this mean for the Ethereum rollup landscape? What does this mean for optimism? What does it mean? Like, what's your perspective here with just the impact here? I think this is a major step towards maturing and realizing the Ethereum scalability vision. I think it's been a long time coming that Uniswap would eventually have a chain just for its scalability purposes. And it's super exciting that it's going to be, you know, joining the ranks of other L2s within the super chain. And, you know, now uh, more than ever, it's going to be important that we solve, you know, fragmentation and interoperability. But, you know... That's on us. We're we're working on it. Uh, Hayden, uh, maybe you could talk about what does a uni chain actually look like. Uh, why does yeah. Uniswap need a chain? We have we have a Uniswap. We have many Uniswaps and many different chains. Why are we creating a uni chain? Yeah, so I, I think it has to start with like how blockchains are going to scale generally, and like then also how we approach building products and building protocols. And uh, uni chain is really just like the chain that we want to see in the world, uh, the, particularly the L2, and one that's really built for Uniswap users and uh, you know the needs of you know DeFi and the needs of you know the L2 ecosystem. And you know the way that I think about it is that uh, we are on you know Ethereum for you know there's all this like debate about where should DeFi live? Should it be L1 or L2? There's that whole like can of worms on Twitter right now, and there's also um, just this concept of the roll-up centric roadmap, uh, which is basically that like today Ethereum is being designed and built uh, with, you know, essentially a layer two scaling uh, vision in mind. Um, and we at Uniswap tend to be, you know, very practical and very focused on our users, which is like, how do we within that world create the best user outcomes? Um, how do we kind of like accelerate this this vision for scaling blockchains, which we think is uh, really exciting. And people talk about blockchain scaling. I think the really like, I like just like reducing things down for myself. And it's like, blockchains are kind of like servers with cool properties, um, right? If you need your server to never go offline, uh, if you need your, ser- uh, you know, you might want to use one of these fancy blockchain servers that add on, you know, decentralization. If you want your server to not have operators that are stealing your money, et cetera. Um, and so when you think about how servers scale, how do you scale servers? You just have more of them or beefier servers. And that's kind of what like the L2 vision is, is that we have like more chains and beefier chains. And uh, the thing, that the, the challenges that we face in that world is, um, you know, like w- when, when we were running every application on Ethereum on a single server on the L1 mainnet, um, and again, it's not a, it's this decentralized cool blockchain server. I'm not saying it's just a server, but when you run it all on that, you get these really nice properties um, because everything can communicate. Like your balances are the same across every applica- application. Your the user experience of moving between applications is very seamless because it's all running in the same environment. Um, and so we were able to create these like very high quality user experiences. You know, people don't want to think about managing their assets across multiple networks. Users don't even want to think about pretty much anything. Uh, users just want to like have an action they want to perform and they want that to be as simple as humanly possible. Um, and then when you uh, look at what has happened as we start to scale into many L2s, uh, you get this world where there's like, okay, we're scaling by, par- like by paralyzing and by creating more of these things, but 
liquidity and user experience and interacting between the different systems uh, is getting more and more complex. And today that is being put on users, on end users. And uh, what we are aiming with Unichain is how do we, you know, create systems where you get the, the you know, some of the user experience benefits we had when everything ran on one chain. Um, how do we kind of create this like seamless uh, user experience, whatever chain you're on, um, but then also and, and how do we reduce some of the fragmentation of liquidity, the fragmentation of user experience that's happening? Um, and how do we kind of just like, and then with this opportunity, you know, part of the benefit of scaling and moving to layer two is, is there are also benefits. So how can we like use the unique, uh, you know, benefits and landscape of layer two to further improve on that user experience beyond what we were ever able to do on L1, even when everything was running in the same place to create like a very fast, very cheap, um, but still, you know, decentralized, still, you know, uh, like uh, having good trust properties uh, version of Uniswap. Um, so it's it's kind of aiming to be this like L2 kind of liquidity hub uh, that is designed to have the properties that are most useful for DeFi um, and and can be really like a home for, for, for DeFi and, uh, and uh, you know. Home for DeFi, L2 liquidity hub. Hayden, I just have a, a bunch of rapid fire, just general questions. Right. So this it. thing is called uh, the Unichain. When is it launching? Uh, you know, drop the, the it's cleaner. But um, it's, uh, yeah, when is this launching? It's actually launching very, very soon. I think that, you know, it's basically with, with this announcement, um, uh, it's going to, uh, we're going to have a test net out, okay. uh, you know, right away. And then uh, it will be launching, um, you know, uh, Imminently, very soon uh, this year. Um, okay, and then so we have an uh, congrats on that. We have an uh, uh, optimism, an OP chain, basically. So this implies kind of like EVM running on the OP stack, that sort of thing. And is this is the plan to like take Uniswap the protocol uh, and deploy it on this chain, or are we like for are we migrating anything from the existing? Uh, you know, the home for Uniswap is sort of on the Ethereum L1. Will Ethereum remain the L1 remain the home of Uniswap? And like, what 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 will actually be Uniswap about uh, the Unichain? And will it also be a home to other DeFi apps? Like, so when we think about a DeFi chain, L2 chain, we we sort of think of something like um, Optimism itself, or something like Base, let's say, or something like Arbitrum, yep. and it's kind of general purpose across all sorts of different DeFi. Is it like that? G give us some more color here. Yeah, of course. Let's let's just go through it all, and and I can even start to talk about some of like the tech technical changes and improvements or enhancements that we've been thinking about for our our specific version. Uh, look, at its core, it's it's funny when you talk about like even optimizing for a specific use case, you still generally end up wanting to support the general class of use cases, mm -hmm. uh, right? So it is a you know like base like optimism. It is a you know general purpose roll up, um, okay. but uh, we've you know uh, parameterized it and kind of. Uh, you know, build systems around it that are really optimized for DeFi and for, uh, you know, uh, things that we've learned uh, in, 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 you know, in the course of developing Uniswap as well as our products um, that are built around Uniswap. Um, and so it's really like, you know, designed for DeFi in mind and designed for like the, the specific needs and use cases. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it, it's still like a general purpose roll up um, and, and can have all sorts of applications built on top of it. Um, I, I will, I'll say that like one thing when you kind of compare like what is mainnet's role and how does this fit next to mainnet, um, I'll say that like the, the world of like mainnet being the central hub. And by mainnet, uh, so you mean the L1, yes. Sorry, Ethereum L1, okay. Ethereum mainnet being this like sort of a starting point that people onboard. Like right now what we have, and it's actually one of the core reasons that everything feels so broken. And I, I can come back to that. Uh, mm. Ethereum is being built, and, it's, and I think it's a. I actually think Ethereum's roadmap is like pretty good. Um, Ethereum is being built entirely with the in the mind, you know, with the mind of like L two, like an L two centric vision, where most people, where most users, most applications are living on L two, and they're ultimately like settling on. And you have proving systems on L one, and you have data availability on L one, and and it's like ultimately settling there. But like the you know, when you talk about like what users actually need, they need like something that's like much lower, like. Ethereum is optimizing for this like very extreme level of decentralization and censorship resistance, which is like suitable for like being this like world settlement layer. And I, th I think there's like a lot of value to that. Um, but like when it comes to like your average user, they need transactions to happen. Even like a second is too slow, right? You need like subs, you need like 
millisecond kind of, not one millisecond, but you need like very fast blocks, right? And so we're aiming for uh, 200 to 250 millisecond blocks. And we can come back to how we're aiming to accomplish that. But that sounds um, you know, like you NASDAQ to... on chain, Hayden. Sure. <laughs> no, I, I think that like, it's, it's still like, you know, using this like decentralized blockchain technology to do very cool decentralized things that NASDAQ would never, never dream of. <laughs> um, but, um, and I also think it's still like, you know, a general purpose thing. People can build, you right. know, permissionlessly build all sorts of cool things on top of it. Uh, but so just to jump back to your actual question, because I, I feel like I didn't quite um, get through that, is, is that, you know, part of the fragmented broken experience we have today is that L1 is going to be the most expensive place. So if L1 is a hub, if L1 is a starting place, then everything is subject to that most, the, 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 like the most expensive of the chain. Like L1 should be the most expensive chain. If L1 is the most expensive chain, then, and we start every user there, and every token is created there, and every application is created there, and then you have to move into L2s, and then to move between L2s, you go through L1, then you have this thing where every single user ends up paying L1 costs all the time. You need to start users in an L2, and then they need to move between L2s directly. Um, and, 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 and it needs to be very fast and it needs to be very cheap. And when you do that, you can create like, you know, when we think about like every transaction needs to happen in under a second and it needs to happen with, for under you know, one cent, right? Like that's what we think about when we think about the products we're building for our users. And you can't do that when mainnet is like the place that everyone is. Um, main, and, and I don't think that we should try to build mainnet in a way that that is the case. I think we should just like, you know, figure out how can we, you know, use the benefits of mainnet to, to kind of enhance the decentralization of faster, more scalable layer twos that can interoperate with each other, that you can, you know, very quickly move, move funds in between, very quickly bridge between them. Um, so we have all these like technical enhancements and, and, and things that we're building around Unichain that will create the like, basically the user outcomes that we're aiming for and the user experiences we're aiming for. And ultimately we see this as like an acceleration of Ethereum scaling roadmap, kind of a, you know, a, as well as like a, you know, uh, kind of acceleration, even of you know the, the you know of the super chain and 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 Carl's vision and and kind of this sort of like advancement of how we scale layer twos and and create good user experiences on top of them. Yeah, let's bring in the the super chain. I think the user user experience that no one wants is that I have my assets on some other layer two, and now I have to bridge them over to the uni chain. I have to make my swap, and then I have to bridge them back. Uh, Carl, maybe you can kind of uh, talk to us about the role of the super chain here and the interop uh, uh, puzzle pieces that are bringing uh, to the table with this whole uni chain thing. Totally. So the super chain is exactly here to address that kind of network switching and you know high latency interoperability pain points and so that comes in the form of a couple things one it comes in most most importantly shared standards so the op stack shared standard across all of the chains within the super chain this gives developers the ability to build their application and rely on each one of those chains working and functioning in roughly the same way. That is like the core primitive that is most important. And so it's actually, by the way, super exciting to see Uniswap uh, uh, building out all of these extensions and improvements to the OP stack, to the super chain, because that is going to, as Hayden said, increase or improve the scalability story and the interoperability story for all of Ethereum. So what we're really trying to do to kind of like nail in or drill into the interoperability stuff is we have kind of one, we have Ethereum-wide interoperability standards that we are pushing forward, things like cross-chain intents, things like, uh, you know, chain-specific addresses. There's a huge amount of stuff we can do to unify all of Ethereum and defragment it and provide, you know, shared liquidity. And then there are things that we can do also within the super chain, within the chains that have shared standards, such as really low latency interoperability and, you know, really low, you know, zero slippage, uh, you know, token transfers, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually super excited from uh, for Uniswap, both contributing to the kind of cross-chain intents and like bridging the broader Ethereum ecosystem because, yeah, Uniswap is on all of these different chains and also for being, you know, a, a key member of the super chain and uh, uh, sharing the OP stack and improving it together. Yeah, it might help if um, I talk a little bit about like even the what we, we keep alluding to these like improvements or enhancements or extensions to the super chain that we were building and how it like relates to these user properties. It might make sense for me to just explain what they are sure. and what we're actually talking about here. 
Um, uh, we'll also add that in, in addition to like protocol level standards, even like interface standards, one of the reasons it's like a really exciting collaboration is that we've always been very user focused and, and, and front end focused as, in addition to the protocol level thinking that we do. And we kind of try to like bridge, we, we try to bridge, you know, be a bridge between like understanding users, understanding application development, understanding protocol development, understanding chain development, and kind of like uh, span the, the full tech stack and in, in thinking there. So just want to add that even like interface standards, when you talk about like how wallets interface with chains and even like display balances, et cetera, et cetera, like removing the network switcher, all that stuff is like, is like part of this. And, and so it's where we just want to like build the user experiences and like work through each problem iteratively. But when it comes to the, um, the technical enhancements, uh, there's basically like two main areas that we're, so at its core, we still have this like, you know, sequencer roll up model that, that is, you know, used and adopted by optimism and, and, uh, and base. And then what we have, we have basically like two components that we've built on top of it, um, which, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about. One is basically like a builder and, and one is, uh, basically like a, you know, a verification service. Um, uh, like, so the, the builder kind of comes before transactions, uh, you know, go into the sequencer. Um, and then the, the verification service actually happens after the sequencer, but before they're, you know, finalized on L1. So we have these like additional layers, uh, at its core, you still get the, like the experience and the scalability be benefits of the single sequencer. Uh, but at the builder level, we're able to, um, essentially create, uh, you know, we, we have these things we were basically calling flash blocks and we're even partnering with the flash bots team on building this is, you know, a system where we basically can do, um, you know, it, there's sort of these like fundamental like limits you run into, like how fa like long does it take to Merkleize the state, and that and that you know leads to slower block times. That's why you sometimes have like rollups that have these like yes, it's fast, it's faster than L1, which is 12 seconds, but it's still like two-ish seconds or one-ish seconds. Um, and so we're we, we've created these flash blocks, which are these like sub blocks um, that we're, we're aiming for 200 to 250 millisecond um, at, at at release. Um, which by the way will be a you know, by release, I mean release of this uh, upgrade. This will be, um, or enhancement, this will be not, the, the very first version of the mainnet will just be like the, the sequencer model and we'll have this coming soon after and we'll have a test net for it and all of that. Um, and these are, these are very like new technical innovations. Uh, but we're basically aiming for 200 to 250 millisecond uh, flash blocks, which are essentially, um, it's running inside a, a trusted execution environment, TEE. It's a, that's a whole hot topic on, on Twitter at times. I, I think I can like break down how I think about that. But essentially what that allows you to do is enhance, the way I think about TEE is, is you can take things that are fully, like, that are more centralized today and you can add additional properties and improvements on it. It's not like a replacement for decentralized consensus or, or decentralized nodes. It's more like you can in, improve on the trust properties of things like sequencers and add cool new, you know, trust guarantees and, and, and cool things. And so what we're doing within the TE is basically like uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, building these smaller blocks that are ultimately uh, being laddered up into these bigger blocks that the sequencer is posting and uh, also emitting like these like uh, these state updates so that people can uh, from the, like the perspective of someone, for example, doing you know arbitrage between a centralized exchange and a decentralized exchange, um, you will be able to you know do these arbitrage trades at these 200 to 250 millisecond uh, flash block increments. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for the full one to two seconds. From a user's perspective, making a swap, your transaction will feel confirmed because you have this sort of like it's been built within a block in the TEE, which will then be passed to the sequencer who will post it to the chain. Uh, so you sort of it's it's kind of like a proposer, but it's a, it's inspired by proposer builder separate. Uh, and it's building that, you know, proposer system or builder system within a trusted execution environment to improve on the trust properties. Um, another thing that's kind of very interesting with, with flash blocks and TEs is that we are also able to kind of enforce priority ordering. Um, this is kind of a, I, I'm a little nervous to go super technical and deep here, but I, I think I should for a second. Just, it is that like, uh, you know, I don't, there's this blog post from, from Dan at Paradigm called uh, priority is all you need. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is a whole can of worms in and of itself, but essentially what it is saying is you can go a long way uh, when it comes to MEV redu reduction and minimization, you know, using uh, prior when you have very strong guarantees around the priority, around basically transactions being ordered in a fair priority gas auction. Um, and I can talk about why, why, but essentially we are within the TE, we are kind of enforcing that transactions are ordered uh, in a fair priority gas auction. Uh, which 
will, which we can then use to basically enhance how we uh, do trades through things like Uniswap X to uh, have a really, really clean, nice trade-off space of like transaction inclusion speed and reducing the value that is today extracted from end users of Uniswap. It's about a billion dollars a year. Um, uh, in the form of like, you know, sandwich attacks and, and MEV and whatever. Um, uh, I, I can go deeper on that. It's, I also feel like I just went deep on it. I, but uh, so, so anyway, that's the TE. I, I can also get to the verification service, which comes after. But essentially, uh, that's, that's sort of the, the, the builder thing. Um, okay, I, I kind of want to just yeah, finish the, sure. one, we did the, a, the last little piece there. For, for bankless listeners who want to yeah. go down this rabbit hole, we did an episode with Shay um, from Flashbots Sweet. a lot on TEs and this very subject. Uh, and, and like, well, there's, there's two things that, um, two parts of this whole Unichain thing that really impacts Ethereum. There's the under the hood technical uh, tech stack yep the MEV supply chain, how that's going to be impacted. And that's kind of what Hayden was introducing. And then there's also just like the users who don't care. And I just yep. have tokens on some chain and I might want to swap them. I think we could do, um, listeners, uh, um, maybe we can try and help simulate that experience and it, what that yeah, is I actually think, like for them. I, I think when it comes to the 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 users, when it, when it comes to everything I just said, mm -hmm. um, it's like, it basically shows up in two forms. It's faster and it's cheaper. Like I... You know, like the 250 millisecond block time, like right now, when you make a trade on mainnet, the user waits 12 seconds. And they also, also, you know, oftentimes they get a worse price than they could have gotten because either because it took 12 seconds and the price moved or because, uh, you know, uh, because you don't know what the price will do in 12 mm -hmm. seconds, you actually have to set this wider slippage tolerance. So people, it, it creates more MEV opportunities. So people can essentially like put trades in front of them to make the, you know, and then the price won't be as good as they were expecting. And so they have to like, you have to sort of set these wide slippage parameters. Right. Generally, you know, what we're aiming for is uh, transactions that are fast enough that, you know, it feels instant to the human eye, right? That's what you want when you're building a user-facing application. Um, I think the, the big and, question yeah. I have, Hayden, is like, it, it's great that this is an improvement from mainnet, but like also how do I access it? Like, do I have to be yeah. inside of the Optimism super chain to be able to access this? Uh, if yeah. I'm on base, uh, do I have to swap over to Unichain or to, can I swap from base? Like, what is kind of the, the user experience of this whole process? Yeah, so I think that like some of these things are going to be like uh, generally there's like one thing that I want to uh, push on is like this like cross chain intense trading system. So we when we we had you know announced Uniswap X back in the day, and then we talked about this like future cross chain Uniswap X version. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, we we were like, well, we want it to be a true standard. More and more people can adopt. We just call it cross chain Uniswap X. You know, and so we started, we wanted to work with other partners on how do we abstract it into a thing that is useful for more people. Um, but essentially the way that you think about, uh, you know, crossing yourself X is it's aiming to create this like seamless experience of moving assets of, you know, I have an asset, I want to buy another asset. It doesn't matter what chain it's on. Um, let's have, let's like the, let the marketplace figure it out. Let's let sophisticated actors behind the scenes figure out how to make that order happen uh, in a way that feels seamless for the user. Um, the important thing, I think the really important thing here is that like, like that, that is like the abstraction layer under the hood. The people that are making those orders happen, the fillers, et cetera, are using the best systems for rebalancing assets between chains available to them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, and so the better bridge, bridging happens under the hood, you know, the faster the bridging, et cetera, the, the higher quality the bridging, the, the better that system becomes, um, right? We're essentially a, have built a marketplace where people can, uh, you know, express an intent. I want to have an asset. I want, I want to buy an asset. It doesn't matter what, like, it can be on this chain or that chain. And then you've created a system by which other people can meet, match that intent. But then those people have, like, the better systems available to them. So when you, it comes to things like super chain interop, right? You know, th that, that is, in my mind, just basically building very, very, like, any chain within the super chain, you get very, very fast bridging. And so what that looks like is it looks like, you know, uh, much cheaper, more liquid kind of uh, settlement of these orders. Um, it, it, you know, we will still be able to, like, create these same interoperable systems to some degree against other chains, uh, outside of the super chain, right? We have Uniswap deployments on all these different chains. They're going to continue to exist for, um, and 
but, it, but the bridge is underneath them, moving assets between a non-superchain chain and a superchain chain. The fundamental underlying bridges that are used are just going to be, you know, more expensive or slower or have more risk associated. So uh, we're, we're aiming to create a user experience kind of holistically, no matter what chain you're on, no matter where you are, that uh, really does just like completely abstract away chains, more or less. I think that it will be easier to do. It will be like more liquid. It will be easier to build these like settlement connectors and, and it'll be much like within the super chain, it will be extremely easy as we start to work with other chain or try to get other chains and to like, like when someone wants to buy an asset on another chain, like it, it's going to be slower and harder to figure out like each new, like everything within the super chain, the, the whole idea of standards is that, you know, it's like consistent and easy to interface with because you've had, you have like, and we, we deal with this all the time, right? We're building a user interface, new chains launch, there's new deployments. And every time we add a new chain, if it's, you know, if it's an entirely new proprietary, you know, uh, system, it's like takes way longer for us to add support than if it's like a well-understood, well-known chain that is standardized with similar to other chains. Um, I, I want to ask that just the high level question, like yeah. on, the, on the user side. So there will be haters. Believe me, there are haters out there. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Well, I've never had a hater. Okay. So <laughs> no, there, no one's there, ever gotten mad at me on Twitter for there, anything. There are haters out there who will hear this and they'll say, yeah. okay, so Ethereum's solution to fixing the L2 fragmentation problem is wait, wait for it. Launch another chain. Yet another chain. It's the it's the classic standard, uh, the standards meme. Like we exactly. have too many computing standards. Let's build a new standard. Okay. I, so yeah. Can we can yeah. we address that head on? Because yeah, so of course. I, I'm getting kind of a rough contour of this, where basically, uh, Uniswap is uh, launching the Unichain. That's going to be another chain yeah. in the OP stack ecosystem inside yeah. of a, an emerging super chain. And hopefully, yep. my hope is the super yep. chain, which is all of the OP stack chains, will gradually start to feel like one chain so it's completely yeah. abstracted away so if i'm on base or optimism or the new uni chain it's all kind of the same to me from a user perspective the ux is the same it'll just feel like the same chain experience now i th yeah. i hope that's where we're headed maybe you could flesh that out but that still uh like leaves the problem of how about some of these other l2 ecosystems yeah. so there's arbitrum and Uniswap has uh, deployments there. There's of all course. of the ZK Sync ecosystems, like Polygon, Matter Labs, all of that. And so maybe we can unfragment a super chain. But what about all of the other super chains out there? And I, I want to address. Yeah. Let, let's address the haters head on. Uh, so Hayden, okay. what, what do you say? Let, to yeah, that? let me start, and then I think Carl might also have thoughts here. But um, I, I'm going to start by saying, like, my perspective on like trade, like where assets should live and where balances should live within wallets. I think the chains. Our, to our tokens should basically mostly be held on the chain on which they're issued, um, like or like like any like essentially like assets that are that are bridged are passively at risk to like when you, when you think about like like the current model for L 2s is like most assets are issued on mainnet. Um, so in in addition, most assets should not be issued on mainnet. But we'll we'll come back to that. So most assets are issued on. Uh, mainnet, and then they're bridged into these L2s, and then they're like passively sitting in these bridges, um, and or they're, they're issued or they're issued on an L2 and a bridge. Like there's sort of this model where we have like passive liquidity and AMMs on chains for assets that were issued on other chains. And essentially, my mo mental model for how things should look is that like uh, you know maybe certain assets. I mean, obviously ETH should be on should be issued on L1, right? But like assets basically ultimately hold their value where like people see them as having like social like where the social consensus is of like is on what their their value is, right? And so like ETH is always going to have the most value on L1 and be like the most safe and whatever on L1. And and so what you know we want to create is a model where you know you can buy if you have an asset on you know like essentially you can abstract away the chains and you you only think about assets right when you're it, within uniswap's context right like you when someone goes into uniswap they don't want to think i'm holding eth on this network right our network selector is becoming kind of a nightmare because you search eth and there's like 20 eth across 20 chains <laughs> yeah. um and what what it should really be is a user's onboarding into a wallet the wallet stores you know you know they 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 have a, a, a kind of a, a chain that they keep their like balances on um, right. And uh, they're, they're balanced in like, what is it like a unit of account asset or like whether it's ETH, you know, whether they want ETH to be their money or USDC to be their money. Like you basically have like one or two assets that people treat as units of accounts. Then you buy a token and you buy that token. And at the end of that transaction, that asset is sitting in your account on the chain on like on the chain that it like holds the most value essentially. Um, right. Like if you're buying, you know, um, if you're buying, uh, you know, an L2 native token on base, you should probably be holding it in your wallet on base. 
Um, and what we need to do is have trading systems and, and interoperability systems that, that and, and because a user, like, again, like every user facing application should not show you networks. That's like, it's like basically like, it's, it would be like if your, you know, if your email client showed you every AWS server that like you were, if every user, it's just like nonsense. And so, um, well, you know, that's what like this, like, even like the cross chain use of X or, or the, the EIP 7683 um, is, is a partially about just like allowing you to like essentially swap between native assets on different chains. This is kind um, of the Vitalik school of thought that like what we need is uh, UX improvements that will fix yeah. fragmentation and just like wallet standards and some yeah. simple things I, to just like we, abstract a UX. And good right? news is that we have a wallet and like. I think the thing that we're one of the things that we're so excited about when we talk about like bridging the tech stack is that we get to like face these problems head on and just like work through them. There's a sort of like part of the problem that we have in scaling blockchains and Ethereum is that like everyone is building at this like sliver of the tech stack. Like, and it's kind of like you when you think about like blockchain, when you when you use that mental model I said earlier of blockchains as servers, right? Like imagine like so like we have like a thousand people saying we're a server building company. And then like we have a few people saying we build applications on servers, but like we have like you need people that like are like actually thinking like across these systems and how they fit into each other. And that's like what we're trying to do here. Uh, but, you know, I, I know that like, so look, Uniswap will continue to have deployments on other chains. Um, I think that like, um, my hope is that the, the number of different chain ecosystems, like we're kind of, because of this rollup centric roadmap and because Ethereum has intentionally been very um, hands off in how rollups should develop as standard, like, like basically has like kind of like let this like, ecosystem of, of L2s develop, um, we're going to probably have like a reconvergence of, of standards to like probably like, you know, whether it's whether it's one or a few like winning, you know, ecosystems, uh, like ultimately it will probably reconverge over time uh, as standards improve, as quality improves. Um, there will still be many chains uh, within within the super chain or with, um, and just generally we want to make, you know, we really do like in our wallet, we will, you know, you know, we're going to be like on, like people will like on, they'll deposit cash in some form, right? They're going to buy a stable coin. It will probably, you know, within our wallet, ultimately live on, on, on like a uni chain, right? And then they want to buy a token that is on, you know, another chain. Like, I think within the super chain, assets will essentially be fungible, um, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. So you can like almost not think about it, like it will make this like process of, of abstracting very simple. Ultimately, there will be other chains and you will be able to buy tokens on those other chains and create a seamless experience. And at the end result of that transaction, the asset on the other chain will be held on that other chain. Uh, but what we're trying to do with Uniswap, with Unichain in particular, because I feel like I actually have almost not talked about this, is like, we do think a lot of the liquidity should live there and there should be kind of like a hub for liquidity there. Um, the, the thinking there the is essentially right now- main of Ethereum liquidity back onto the one say, central chain. It's a liquidity chain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like right now, a lot of mainnet is like, 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 like mainnet is kind of the liquidity hub and that is like, you know, has some benefits, but I think the, the, the really painful problem there is that anytime you bridge in, out, in and out of mainnet, it's going to be expensive. So you're inherently subject to mainnet gas costs. And mainnet is not trying to improve on those for L1, right? It, or like it is to some degree, but like as roll up more and more roll up to satellite, like it's going to, it's not. Uh, so what we need to do is have a liquidity hub that's on L2 so that we can, you know, have it so that when you like bridge, like the reason that bridging in and out is so painful is because mainnet is slow and expensive. And that's not a pro that's not a knock at mainnet. It's like, it's like by design in terms of how we're scaling it, it's scaling Ethereum. And then like L2 are fast and cheap. And so you can actually build very fast and cheap systems for bridging and abstracting away which chain you're on. Because if you if moving between chains means each transaction is less than a second and less than a cent, then, you know, it won't feel painful to bridge in and out of it. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. And, the super and then like super chain interop is a really good step uh, for us because for, for different chains within the super chain, we'll be able to do that very, very soon. And then over time, I do think that like, you know, essentially every, you know, we should have that with everyone. But uh, yeah, anyway, that long rant, I feel like I'm so, so Car Carl, so, same kind of question uh, to you. And there's two yeah. like sort of bankless predictions that I'll throw into this. W one is actually coming true on today's podcast. We we had mm -hmm. uh, for, for a long time thought that, you know, apps like Uniswap would uh, eventually roll their own chains. And so that's happening. And a second prediction is like Ethereum will fix its fragmentation over time. So we're, we're in this fragmentation stage, fragmented liquidity, fragmented UX and this divergence. And then we're going to swing back to, towards convergence. And the way that the convergence might happen is, is first across kind of like super chain infrastructures. So like everything that's on the same super chain, so base, optimism, the, the new unit chain will all feel as one. 
and we'll still have like ties that are maybe a little bit more clunky to other L2 ecosystems. But eventually, eventually, in the fullness of time, we will unfragment all of the fragmentation. Can you tell us that story? Because this is back to, again, that objection saying, uh, you just rolled another chain to go fix your fragmentation. How's that going to work? Yes, absolutely. So interoperability is the superpower of open source and shared standards. That is what shared standards get you. It gets you interoperability. And so I think actually, you know, for example, the David, your Peloton analogy of everyone contributing to different parts of the OP stack and then upstreaming them back into the shared standard, that thing is starting to come true more and more. And it is critical that as we are moving forward, everyone is converging around shared open source standards that are forkable, that are, you know, people can experiment, all this kind of stuff. And what this ends up looking like is today we exist in this world where because all of the chains are different, you need to reason about each chain individually. You can't say, I'm going to deploy across the super chain or I'm going to deploy across Ethereum broadly. And because of that, it means that as a developer, I'm experiencing maximum fragmentation and that trickles down to the users, that trickles, that, that leaks, that leaky abstraction kind of ruins the whole thing. But the cool thing about Ethereum, the cool thing about all of this open source stuff is that we are working together on these shared standards, on these open source things. And to me, I actually see the kind of the super chain, the progression of the super chain, the progression of, you know, optimism, governance and, uh, you know, the kind of united chains of Ethereum vibe. That thing is starting to happen. And I think there's actually natural incentives for us to collaborate and work together on making it real. I think we're we're all pushing for the same standard. We all benefit from being on the same standard and we are all kind of moving towards that unified Ethereum, you know, vision that is scalable that is able to, you know, uh uh get the next billion, billion, seven billion users. <laughs> New projects are coming online to the Mantle Layer 2 every single week. Why is this happening? Maybe it's because Mantle has been on the frontier of Layer 2 design architecture since it first started building Mantle DA, powered by technology from Eigen DA. Maybe it's because users are coming onto the Mantle Layer 2 to capture some of the highest yields available in DeFi and to automatically receive the points and tokens being accrued by the $3 billion Mantle Treasury in the Mantle Reward Station. Maybe it's because the Mantle team is one of the most helpful teams to build with, giving you grants, liquidity support, and venture partners to help bootstrap your Mantle application. Maybe it's all of these reasons all put together. So if you're a dev and you want to build on one of the best foundations in crypto, or you're a user looking to claim some ownership on Mantle's DeFi apps, click the link in the show notes to getting started with Mantle. The Uniswap wallet is officially the preferred wallet of Bankless, and it's the one we use anytime when we want to transact on-chain. Whether you're on your browser or on the go, Uniswap wallet makes it easier than ever to swap anytime, anywhere. Use your wallet to transfer funds directly from a top centralized exchange and tap in thousands of tokens across Ethereum and over 10 other chains like Base, Arbitrum, and Optimism. Uniswap Wallet delivers deep liquidity, fast execution, and reliable quotes with zero gas swaps through Uniswap X. And when it comes to security, you can rest easy knowing it's backed by Uniswap Labs, one of the most trusted teams in DeFi. Their code is open source and independently reviewed, so you know it's protected. So why wait? Download the Uniswap Wallet today on Chrome, iOS, and Android. And don't forget to claim your free uni.eth username directly in the mobile wall. Start swapping smarter with Uniswap. Launching a token? Don't let complex legal and tax issues slow you down. Toku provides specialized support to optimize your launch and ensure that you as a founder and your team and your investors get the most tax efficient outcomes. The Toku team understands the crypto space inside and out and will ensure your token launch is fully compliant while maximizing tax efficiency. Toku can connect you with the best attorneys if you need them to make sure that you have the best advice and Toku can help to optimize your taxes so you pay the least possible amount of taxes while still maintaining legal compliance. With Toku's guidance, you can concentrate on building your company while Toku handles the logistics. Token launches don't have to be complicated. Talk to Toku today to get a free initial token valuation. And so Carl, <laughs> are you optimistic that's like, as again, back back to kind of the, the cynic coming to this episode, they'll see another chain, but they'll also say, guys, all the chains are, you know, all the different L2s and L2 ecosystems are playing zero-sum games against each other, right? It's a war of all against all. And so, you know, Uni Uniswap is coming in and launching the Unis Unichain. They're talking about um, them being kind of a home for global DeFi liquidity. Well, guess what? Every single L2 ecosystem also wants that. And you're all kind of building the same thing. I 
Now, so we have a coordination problem here, Carl, and I can see how it's uh, coordinated across the super chain. So we get that step. But like, are you optimistic that we're going to be able to coordinate across the entirety of Ethereum? So if I'm an Ethereum user, there's just like one United Chains of Ethereum, one like user experience for me, one place for uh, like you know, all of the liquidity. Yes, I am very bullish. Here's here's why I am very bullish because all of the chains within the super chain. Part of that whole deal is that they're all contributing back to retroactive public goods funding. And what is retroactive public goods funding doing? It is funding open source standards for all of Ethereum. I think that the boundaries between a lot of these, you know, ecosystems, etc., like there are definitely like dividing lines and whatnot. But I actually think that part of the reason why I've been just, oh, it's the L2 space has been historically so incredibly toxic is just because there is all of this like, you know, tribalism around these tech stacks. Like, no, we are building open source MIT licensed software that we want to you know create that you know that flywheel where everyone is transacting on the network where is that where where is that money going well it's going to the people who created that value you know impact equals profit going to fund the open source software that you know the whole thing is based on so i i do think that there is like a real non trivial convergence around you know what the ethereum vision like the ethereum vision and you know, everything that we've all been doing. And I think it's like it's like this weird thing where we don't realize we're all working on the same thing. Even different L. Wellens, they're all working on the same thing. Anyway, this gets a little bit metaphysical, but like still, I, I just wanna, have to exp vent. <laughs> I, I just want to also, I think I invite you guys to to like think, like to replace the word blockchain with server in your brains more often. I, again, I, I literally, it helps with things like this. And the reason I use this analogy is not because it's perfect. But it's because it helps answer questions like this. Like, every server is toxic to every other server. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like insane. It's like idiotic. It's, it's like people, things need to have purpose. Well, why are we like this? Like, it's, it's, <laughs> because of, like, if you want the honest answer, it's because there are tokens, tokens. and people. Yeah, care yeah that's about where the, that's like, where the metaphor breaks it's down. It's just, because... it's, like, that's all it is. Like, but like, servers usually serve applications or other servers like 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 they have purposes and use cases and there's going to be a lot of them and like mm -hmm. it's like we are building something that we think you know will will have a unique value proposition and purpose in the world mm -hmm. um right and that's why we're building it um you know, there's all things we're excited about, like Unichain native tokens, and we're excited about, like, you know, all of the kind of, like, again, there will be the Uniswap deployments on, you know, Uniswap V4 is going to be deployed to all the chains. To, and that's a question people will have. We're going to deploy Uniswap V4 to all to, to the diff, all the different L2s. We're not like picking and choosing and only favoring ourselves. We're but but Unis, Unichain, you know, uh, will is, is like designed with a specific kind of like you know the same way that different servers are optimized for different applications building on top of them. Like we're we're designing Unichain to be optimized for you know as like a this like L2 liquidity hub home for DeFi thing. And it's it's I think that's a really unique useful value proposition for the world. Um, it it has these really cool user properties that we've been thinking about our users and what they need and we're 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 expressing that in terms of how we think about you know. Uh, how a chain should be parameterized and optimized and uh, the systems that should be built around it. Um, so Uniswap and, is not launching a chain, it's launching a server then. That's what you're telling us. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's the, the cool, I mean, and it, by the way, important to the analogy is that like there's servers with unique properties and superpowers, right? The unique property of, um, you know, uh, you know, like if you want your server, if your server is so critical to the world that it can never go down, you really need a lot of redundant copies running in a lot of, you know, if, if it's so critical to your server, like if, if it's critical that your server, you know, can't like kick off arbitrary parties and is permissionless because it's like a global piece of infrastructure, you need one of these fancy blockchain servers. Like they have mm -hmm. a purpose to them. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the whole like kind of like, but a lot of like the like to toxicity that sometimes comes up in crypto is just these like religions that form around, you know, around the e economic incentives, incentives of the various parties involved in, in the religions. And like, that's not really the, the, the kind of the game we're playing. We're, we're trying to build like useful products for users, useful products for developers, you know, useful, you know, and, and useful like platforms and, 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 and uh, shared standards for how to like, you know, uh, bring money into the Internet. Just a couple of uh, logistical questions about um, how this thing is getting built that I want to bang out here. Uh, the Uni token, is there an association between the Uni chain and the Uni token? So I think that like 
generally when we think about Uniswap's, you know, you know, unique, uh, you know, and Uniswap, I mean, broadly, like, you know, the, the community, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of users, et cetera, like you, there's like some unique things that, uh, Uniswap has that like, uh, for, uh, I think that position it really interestingly. And Uniswap has always been like very decentralization first, uh, right? We've always like tried to go the extra mile, the extra like, like kind of even like before Uniswap v1, people made their smart contracts upgradable because they were like, there's no way you can have a non-upgradable smart contract. And, you know, we're going to, and then we like kind of even pioneered this, like migrate to a new, a new contract if you build a better one. And that's just an example. That's not, but the point I'm making here is that like, we've always been very decentralization focused. And so when we like look at the model, we think, how can we continue to improve and enhance on it? And that's why, for example, even like a lot of the blocks are being built in this, in the TE is kind of replacing some of the and then the other, on the, on the other side, we're, we're, we built a system essentially for like validating and verifying the actions of the sequencer. Um, and so that's what the, uni, you know, the Unichain verification service, I think that's the name, um, is, is doing. It's kind of a, you know, a, it's like a, you know, a system of, of nodes um, and, uh, you know, you can like, you know, stake and you can kind of verify the, the transaction, the blocks that the sequencer is being built. And it kind of provides a sort of like additional layer of, of kind of, uh, of, uh, check and balance and 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 uh, verification of of what the sequence is doing, so that you could uh, either detect bad behaviors or you have like this additional layer of, um, uh, like like you you know almost like economic security or faster finality. So you have like different levels. You have like many different tiers of finality. There's like oh, it's been confirmed in a flash block in a 250 millisecond increment. Oh, it's been conf posted by the sequencer. Oh, it's been, you know, very, like that. So it goes to 250 milliseconds to like one second to like, oh, it's been like, you know, validated within the Uniswap verification service. That's like another layer of, of uh, finality that happens, you know, not too soon after the sequencer. And then there's the final layer, which is it's been confirmed on Ethereum and Ethereum has been finalized, right? So it's just like an additional layer in between the sequencer, uh, which is v very fast. And Ethereum, which is pretty slow, it's like an additional layer of, of uh, economic, economic finality. And that's sort of where, you know, we expect the, the, the Uni token and Uniswap community to kind of play a role in, in verifying the chain. And then who is also operating the sequencer? Where is that sequencer being managed? Uh, yeah, so the, the sequencer itself, you know, much like Coinbase is operating the base sequencer and blah, blah, blah. We, we will be running the, the Uniswap Labs will basically be running the uh, sequencer um, for, for Unichain. Um, what and, what, uh, what uh, L two beat stage will you guys be at kind of launch and uh, what's what's the plan to you know progress beyond that? Is it just like uh, basically part of the OP stack um, upgrade cycle? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's like yeah, so it's going to be like yeah, they're they're at L one and or to stage one, and I think you know we'll we'll be at stage one as well. Okay, and then so the Uni token, um, you you were implying that that would be somehow involved in the verification layer, uh, in some yeah. way, sort of like a staking, a mechanism, something like this. Yeah, you know, you you deposit it, you validate the chain, and and uh, for money, yeah. uh, do you validate you the know, chain for money? Yeah, that's usually how it works. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> well, what is even money, huh, David? Uh, well, um, I don't know. It depends on if you think it's well, money. Well, 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 uh, we I happen, happen, to, we happen to think that, Hayden. Uh, and that that brings us to another question about this. And I'll, I'll go back to kind of the like back to kind of the the cynic uh, here. The, there's been a discussion lately around where should DeFi live? You alluded to it earlier in the, the episode. Uh, should DeFi in Ethereum world live on the L1 or on L2? And so, you know, one case for the uh, L2 roadmap, of course, if you are a believer in the economics of Ether and, and you, you, you think it's money, it's basically that Ether, the asset will propagate throughout all of these layer twos and be a, pr not the only, reserve asset, but will be a monetary reserve asset in all of these layer two. So yep. ETH economy expands good for Ether the asset. The other side of that argument is basically like, well, if uh, Ethereum layer one, that's a layer one, loses all of its DeFi and all of the liquidity is kind of sucked out. And Uniswap is a big contributor to that liquidity and has been from day one. Yep. So, and by the way, the mainnet deployments are immutable. L1 smart contract. We're going to deploy V4 to mainnet as well. For sure, part. sure. Yeah, so yeah. it never loses that. But now it yeah. has some L2, uh, you know, let's say, competitors. Um, some people yeah. view this as a, a competitive type relationship and a zero-sum relationship, right? And it's starting to uh, accrue all of the execution transactions, all of the MEV. And if you look at, like, layer twos, they've been phenomenally successful. But they are only yeah. 
the cost to Ethereum, the, the amount that they're charging like back to Ethereum for buy, buying uh, DA and uh, L1, you know, is is a fraction of what they're gaining in terms of like gross profit. Anyway, we could talk about that. At, but yeah, at the I, high level, where does where does I, DeFi look, traffic belong on Ethereum? Look, I, I'm going to start by just saying like if if you know rollups are competitive to Ethereum, then we are really confused as an ecosystem when we're on what we call a rollup centric roadmap. Like <laughs> yes, we're like that's fundamentally what people like, have pointed <laughs> out. Right. So like like I think that like if that's the case, then we are like very deeply confused and we need to like completely reassess like what we're doing. Like because like the, the, the all like the hard forks are like design are like basically like lowering the cost of blob data and the, the roadmap is called the roll centric roadmap. And so like I think that we're like taking that a bit of faith. And I don't think it's a bad roadmap. And I think that you could argue what is a good roadmap, what is a bad I think that it's like it is a an interesting intentional strategy to some degree. Um uh, you, I mean, we're obviously getting at like it's seen you know, part of what you're getting at is like where will the value like what will make ETH a valuable yeah, asset? Yeah, I think like, I, I don't think the critics are saying. The, yeah. yeah, I don't think the critics are saying it's a bad roadmap for Ethereum as a network. Okay, I think yeah. what they're more saying is I, it's a bad roadmap for Ether the asset, which might I, also impact I, like Ethereum. Yeah. Look, I think that like two things. One, I don't think that like yeah, it's super clear. I think it's like de very debatable. I, I, it's very clear that you can't just run all DeFi and L one because. Like you can't simultaneously like Ethereum can't be like too many things at once, right? And like yes, historically DeFi is what has made Ethereum used and useful. And now we have to move to a model where it is scalable, and because it used to be we used to have one second, one cent transactions more not one second, but one cent transactions, like because no one not that many people used it. Now we're like scaling up, and we need more. We just need more servers to run the thing. Huh? That's what L2s are about, right? Like. The, the, the server analogy helps here. It's like you can't run everything on one server. We and we and we and we obviously could make it extremely beefy, but then you know ultimately it will never run everything, right? Like even like you know systems like Solana, right? They're starting to like have these like Solana extensions. It, you can't run everything on one thing. You have to have multiple things. You have to have multiple you know chains. And so uh, I think that Ethereum's roadmap is interesting, and I think it's good um, in terms of how ETH should accrue value within it. I do think that one, there can be a lot of value to just being this like very censorship resistant, very decentralized kind of settlement layer that people are posting data to that they want to have an extreme degree of decentralization. Um, maybe we're like in this weird like moment where like. When all the execution was happening on Ethereum, it was a huge amount of revenue being generated. Mm -hmm. Now it's like we're starting to move it. We're early on in that process. So it's using the data, but the data is not generating that much revenue and there's not that much data availability. Like it's cheap, but it's also not a like it's not like but we're going to like if we have this like explosion in usage of L2s as we make high quality interoperable L2s, there's actually a lot of data that's needed. And a lot of that data probably will want very high decentralization properties. So like my vision for Ethereum is Ethereum should focus on providing as much cheap data availability as humanly possible and that there will be a lot of demand for that and, and make it in, in you know, very highly decentralized censorship position data availability. I, I don't really, I think that it eats as money. Like, I don't know, I've become, I've kind of, I don't care that much either way at this point. I, I think it's useful and good. Um, I like that there's like, I like decentralization. I like that there's like com competing forms of, of, of money and things people store value in. Mm -hmm. I think it can continue to do that and, can, and should continue to do that. But I think that like the focus of Ethereum as a network, as a platform should be on like scaling up how much data availability it can create, um, while retaining the, you know, it's, it's like role as like this like extremely decentralized trusted settlement layer and you think um, you think um you know if if the unit chain is successful that will be good for the ethereum network and for ether the asset um yes i do i, I think i really don't view it as like you know talk to, i think that like there's obviously like um it's kind of like it depends on like you have to like zoom out and like look at the world that like we're trying to create right it's very clear that there's like extremely fragmented like every l2 is different and can interoperate very well and um you know every like you have like the same assets represented across third you have like assets that are like like the user experience like when you use the Uniswap interface like you see a bajillion different chains and you have to like you're very confused um like that's not sustainable right we need a model um that we we do need to scale blockchain and then we need to have do it in a way that creates good user experiences um and uh i think that that is like a you know people get very scared like almost every version of Uniswap People were very scared. They're like, "Oh no! Like this, we're killing our. You know, you're killing your previous thing. You can't be afraid to like to like move into the future. Like the, the actual thing to be scared of is not progress. Is lack of progress, mm. right? That like 
you, you just need to continue advancing and improving on the thing. And like Ethereum, yes, there was a period of time where it was really nice because we only had 100 users. And so it was all really cheap to run everything on one chain. We're not in that world anymore. We have more users. Uniswap, you know, has millions of users at this point, which is cool. And they, you know, and when we need to have billions of users and we can't just have Ethereum be like this one thing that runs it all. Um, yes. It's just not sustainable. It's not scalable. Um, and Ethereum, if it can't adapt, will die. And so it does need to adapt. And that's what it's doing. And that's what the roll-up centric roadmap is about. Um, and I, I do think that this sort of like, let's just run everything on Ethereum again, feels a little bit like going back to the past. And we need to figure out, and it's scary. The future is scary. Change is scary. But we need to embrace change. Mm -hmm. And we just need to figure out what that looks like. And so, mm -hmm. yes, in my mind, if, you know, Ethereum focuses on really cheap, huge amounts of data, it, it probably will be very valuable. I think there's also paths where ETH is valuable as a store of value and as a monetary asset. I think that's also very reasonable. Um, I think that like the only thing that isn't reasonable is like, let's just not progress. Yes. And, and I just want to plus one on the fear thing. There was a huge amount of fear when we were moving from just OP mainnet to the super chain and expanding the vision, changing things. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And it's natural. But I think that the key is that we need to look at where we are heading, what we are trying to do at a high level, which is bring Ethereum to the entire internet, literally change the way that every single person on this planet is operating and interacting and coordinating with one another. And if we stay down that path and we take the straightest shot, then all of these, you know, you know, concerns, fears, etc., like you're gonna have them, we're gonna have them, I'm gonna have them, but we are going to move in a direction that achieves what we are trying to achieve at the end of the day, which is user impact, making the world a, you know, hopefully a better place. Hopefully. Speaking of just like, you know, having a faith about the commitment to the future, Carl, the, the super chain idea has been around uh, 2021, I think, maybe even earlier, uh, bef maybe before it was even called the super chain. And now Ethereum's largest layer one application is becoming a chain in the super chain. Just like reflect for a moment on the path to get here. The thinking of the uh, super chain model before there was even an any evidence to for it in the first place. Yet here we are like just re reflect upon that journey for us so far. I mean, I think that is a true testament towards faith, to be honest, and understanding, thinking about things from first principles. You're like, do we need a shared standard? Yes. Do we need multiple layer twos with their own ecosystems? Yes. How can we make all of these layer twos with their own ecosystems contribute back to public goods to you know can work together and coordinate? Okay, sounds like we're going to need a super chain. With a scalability problem, there is no other solution. And so, you know, we just start going. And it's scary. And we're like, wow, are we going the right way? This seems insane. And then we talk about it in public. And we're still like, oh, my God, this is so insane. And every day, the path gets clearer and clearer. Why is this? It's because we are making progress towards that vision and we are not straying. We're just keep making progress. And so it is incredibly exciting to see the kind of united forces of all of these different chains working together, building on the shared standard, kind of realizing that decentralization vision. That is why I have been in Ethereum, you know, from day one, like this is the dream. This is realizing Ethereum. I mean, what are we out here to do? We're here to scale Ethereum's technology as well as scaling Ethereum's values. And so we've been saying it. We're doing it every day. More chains, more bigger super chain, bigger Ethereum, more users. Happy, happy, uh, happy life. Awesome. Carl Hayden, thank you guys so much for the time today. And congratulations on the uh, on the announcement. When is the actual release? Uh, is there what, what are the dates that you can give us? I think you gave them to us earlier, Hayden, but one more time. Yeah, yeah. The the date that I um, can give you right now is October 10th. Uh, Unichain.org will have all like the developer docs and all the information. You can go start deploying projects and experimenting with it. Um, this is basically the, the, the first instantiation of it. Um, so it's uh, we are going to have an experimental test net coming out in the near future, which will have some of the more advanced features. Um, the you know the the kind of a uh, you know the the flash blocks thing and the Unichain uh, builder thing and the Unichain verification uh, si system. Those are uh, not quite ready to to be released on the test net. 
Um, so there will be a test net for those coming further along the line. Um, uh, and then, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, uh, aiming to, to launch Unichain uh, production this year. Cool. Are, are you guys working with uh, Sorella? Or is, uh, where does Sorella fit in this, uh, in this uh, release? Uh, I, I believe that, that uh, you know, that they're uh, building a hook on USL v4 and uh, whether, whatever chain they uh, put that. I don't, I don't know what chain. Um, I haven't, like, um, uh, you know, I imagine that they will continue to build their hook and... And, wait, wait, uh, lastly, deployed. what is the latest on Uniswap v4? Is, does that have dates yet? Is the Uniswap v4 and Unichain the same thing? Does it have a public date? I don't know if it has a public date or not. It's coming very soon. It's okay. we, The main thing with Uniswap v4, the thing I'll say, yeah, we basically barely talked about it, but uh, Uniswap v4, extremely exciting and awesome. I imagine we'll do like another episode or something on that after the launch or something like that. But Hayden um, thinks he can just waltz back onto Bank. Yeah, you totally yeah. can. Yeah. Every, <laughs> totally anytime I want. Uh, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, saw before, uh, you know, the main thing is that like, because it's an immutable smart contract, we have to like audit it. Like, you know, it's, the, the analogy we use is like a spaceship, right? People eventually put spaceships into space with humans on them, right? It's very scary. Eventually you have to do it. You can't, that's an immutable thing. You can't be like, oh, oops, let's rewrite that spaceship. Well, you know, it's like you you have to launch the spaceship at a certain point, but you have to do a lot of uh, auditing. Ahead of it. So, you know, Uniswap V4 is such a big release, um, such an important protocol upgrade. Um, so we've just been undergoing like the most insane auditing process. Good. I mean, take your time, make happened. it secure. This is why David so, and I are podcasters. We would we, never have we, the guts yeah. to actually I launch I think we've worked with every major auditing <laughs> firm in the entire space already. And we've like, you know, we have like just these like endless rounds of auditing and testing and, and verifying and you know, so we're doing just like a really intensive audit. So the, the code has been frozen for a pretty long, like mostly frozen or like mostly done for a pretty long time. And we've just been like endlessly testing it and mm -hmm. trying to make it as secure as humanly possible because that's, you know, one of the reasons that our, the new things we release get used is because people trust them because, you know, we've never been hacked. And so uh, we aim to make things as secure as possible. And so we've just been uh, grinding on the, on the auditing security front um, for before, but, you know, also coming out uh, this year for sure. Yep. Well, thank you both for your service to Ethereum. Bankless Nation, you guys know the deal. Crypto is risky. You can lose what you put in, but we're headed west into the roll-up frontier. Uh, it's not for everyone, that's for sure. Uh, you can just stick on your monolithic chains if, you, if it's not for you. Uh, but we are glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.